and welcome to the Print Soft Cover, where we launch select non-fiction books. I'm Tere Sudeep, and today in the studio, we have with us Sia Salam. Sia has written uh, a library of books on the lived experiences of Indian Muslims, from flags and skull caps in 2018 to 2020s inside the Tablighi Jamaat. Today, we're here to speak about his latest book, Being Muslim in Hindu India, A Critical View. Welcome, Sia. Thank you. You know, even before you get right into the meat of the book, something stands out in the preface. Uh, I'm just going to read out the passage. Uh, By 2014, there were no politicians willing to use the word Muslim from a public platform. The word being avoided almost like an abuse in civil discourse and replaced with the more euphemistic minorities. Can you elaborate a little more on why drawing attention to this erasure matters? It's very important. See, To be a Muslim today in India 2023 is to be an orphan. Mm. You realize we are living in a democracy and at the time of any elections, be it Vidhan Sabha or Lok Sabha, the common man is supposed to be the king. Every politician of whatever he, he or she comes to the common man with folded hands, seeks votes and so on and so forth. But now we have discovered no politician of any political party Mm -hmm. is ready to use the word Muslim from this stage or even in an interview with with the press or any such thing as I have written they use the word minorities because they are just too scared of using the word Muslim that is the impact which the Hindutva politics has had on Indian polity and Indian society there was a time when Muslims brought up an important part of the electorate. Mm-hmm. Today, there is not a single Muslim minister at the center for the first time ever since 1947. The ruling party has no Muslim MP in Lok mm-hmm. Sabha or Rajya Sabha. Again, for the first time since independence, our prime minister talks of Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas. Where is Sabka Saad? It's just very selective that you take certain people along with you and you make sure the people you take along are not Muslims. Unfortunately, this is not confined to the BJP. Mm -hmm. It's the same for the Congress. If you notice Rahul Gandhi temple hopping in 2019 elections, in the run-up to 2019 elections, how many times did he use the word Muslim? Not once. Even in his so-called Bharat Jolo Yatra, which is a huge success and which in many ways has revived his political career. He made sure that he was not seen with too many Molanas or burqa clad women, Mm -hmm. as if these are the people who should be avoided like plague. Mm -hmm. And that is the sad part of being a Muslim today. Neither the government nor the opposition is even ready to use the word Muslim. Yeah. And... uh You know, you speak about the ballot and you speak about uh, the voter lists, especially. And that's how you begin the book. Uh, Why was it important to begin from the political aspect of it? It's important. As I said just now, that there is no Muslim MP Mm -hmm. in the BJP, which is ruling the, the country since 2014. Also, we see the BJP refusing to give tickets. to Muslims Mm -hmm. in the name of winnability. Now we see the same pattern is being followed by other parties as well Mm -hmm. and not necessarily of NDA Mm -hmm. but even of the so-called Arsoil UPA now India. Mm -hmm. They are doing the same thing. The number of tickets given to Muslim candidates is coming down. At the same time constituencies are being redrawn or have been redrawn in such a manner that Muslim vote is losing its effect, its impact and Muslims are losing their power to choose the candidate they wish. Mm-hmm. For instance, I have, I have talked of Nagina and Bahraj. Like these are the places with a so-called Muslim majority or very close to majority over there. And the constituencies have been redrawn. So the Muslim vote is divided between the two places, two constituencies. At the same time, as Mr. Sharif uh, uh, proved during the Karnataka elections of 2018, So many Muslims have found their names missing from electoral Mm -hmm. rolls. Virtually every fourth Muslim found his name missing from the electoral rolls. He or she might have voted in 2014 or 9 or any other elections before that. Suddenly, in 2018, he found that his name was missing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Same was the case with Dalits. Yeah. But why was it that every fourth Muslim and every sixth Dalit found his name missing and not so for the so-called upper caste and other communities? Mm-hmm. So you don't allow the Muslim to vote. You don't allow the Muslim to contest elections. And where he is able to contest elections and he is able to vote, you redraw the constituencies. Mm-hmm. Where does it lead to? It just tells us that Muslims are not welcome in the parliament. And we have seen it in India's parliament when Asaduddin Uwaisi went to take his oath as a member of parliament. The kind of slogans he was subjected mm-hmm. to, Bharat Mata Ki Jain, that our parliament was not supposed to be a place for those kind of things. Yeah. It was supposed to be a place for civil discourse. Now it seems that just the ruling party will decide the discourse according to its own political ideology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's a stock question in most interviews about books of why did you write it now? But I think the book itself is answer enough. Like every phenomena that you have detailed in every chapter, there's a corresponding event that's happened the past month or even the past week. For instance, there's a chapter on uh, the taboo around halal food and Yogi government in UP has just banned it. So, you know, was it difficult to keep up with this constant, not change, but evolution of information that was coming in? We had to draw a line. Mm-hmm. We drew a line for the first week of August. Okay. So, so it was just as simple. Only thing is when I submitted the first draft to the publishers, mm-hmm. I was very clear that once we edit it, Mm-hmm. I would like to update it till this stage possible. And yeah. they kept that word. And they, in fact, they gave me time for updating the manuscript till first week of August. So it went off fine, except the, the changes which you have noticed and you have talked about, they have not been fine. Mm-hmm. Imagine talking about no yeah. on the run. And you see mosques being demolished, you see houses being demolished. And why particularly no is unsettling for an Indian and not just a Muslim. Mm-hmm. This Mewat belt was the belt where Akbar's Dine Ilahi's proponents were active. Mm-hmm. And they were followers of Dine Ilahi in that particular belt. When Akbar formulated that policy of Sulaikul mm-hmm. back in the 16th century, these people had the best of Hinduism in their life, the best of Islam in their life. So even today you come across a man called Salim Kumar over there mm-hmm. or Rahul Sheikh over there. So these are the people who are living a kind of mixed life. They followed certain cultural practices of Hinduism, certain practices of Islam. And here was an attack on their identity. And mm-hmm. when you attack a person who is living according to the culture of India, you are basically attacking the idea of India. Mm-hmm. And that is why it was very sad whatever happened in Nu. What was heartwarming was how the panchayat of Nu came to the rescue of Muslim traders over there. Mm -hmm. When some right-wing bodies had passed a resolution that no Muslim trader or businessman would be allowed in their village. Then these people spoke up. And therein lies hope for the idea of India. Yeah, You actually um, mentioned earlier when we were talking about how you've personally seen the change of your neighbours and how they behave towards you or Muslims in general. See, it's it's something which many, many Muslims would have come mm-hmm. across over the last 30 years. Back in 1992, I was in Noida at that time and this Babri Masjid Ram Janam Bhumi agitation was in full swing. Almost every evening, we used to have Bajrang Dal volunteers holding a so-called rally in the mm-hmm. colony raising their favorite provocative slogans of Musliman ke Doistan, Qabristan ya Pakistan and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But when the Babri Masjid was actually demolished on December 6th, we had Hindu neighbors coming to our house and offering to stay with us for the night, saying you people are not safe. Ours was the only Muslim family mm-hmm. in the area. You guys are not safe here. Some miscreants could attack you at night. And when we insisted on sleeping at our place only, mm-hmm. Then the head of their family, a matriarch, she said, okay, in that case, I will sleep at your place and I'll open the door if somebody knocks at the door at night or somebody tries to break even. Mm -hmm. That was the kind of support which we got from the Hindu majority community Mm -hmm. in 1992 in Noida on the doorstep of Delhi. Now you kind of compare that, rather contrast that with what I experienced in 2020 on August 5th 
when Narendra Modi had gone to Ayodhya for Bhumi Poojan. Again, similarly, there were right-wing people holding marches, rallies, having trishuls and saffron bandanas and everything. And again, they raised their favorite slogans. Mm -hmm. Only thing was, this time their sloganering and cheering and distribution of sweets went on from about 5, 6 o'clock in the evening to about 11 o'clock or so. Mm -hmm. But not one neighbor came to my house to commiserate. To say, okay, don't worry, we are all together, mm -hmm. it happens and something of that kind. Any word of support, any word of sympathy, no, there was none, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that encapsulates the journey of an Indian Muslim. Yes, criminal riots do take place and wrong criminal activities do take place as in the demolition of Babri Masjid. But when you get support from the larger so society, yeah. you live for another day. But when the social fabric is torn, the hope is torn. Yeah. So, sir, the title, you know, being Muslim in Hindu India evokes a very personal perspective, which there is obviously a lot of it in the book. But the sub had a critical view, ju juxtaposes this a little bit. Was that intentional? Yeah. Why Obviously, so? Can you see, take a little to that. It's, it's also, besides talking of what we have gone through, be it bulldozer or Bilkis Banu or Babri mm -hmm. Masjid and whatever, and all the lynching instances, it's also an attempt to look at where have we gone wrong as a country. Mm -hmm. It's not just a diatribe against any particular political party or any community or any such thing. It's an attempt to look at where have we gone wrong and how can we revive the idea of India and where lies the hope? That yeah. is why we call it in the subhead a critical view. Have you found an answer? Yes, I did. Yeah. And it's there at the end of the book. If you see, uh, we had the Shaheen Bagh struggle, mm -hmm. Shaheen Bagh protest, which started from Delhi, yeah. Shaheen Bagh, in 1919, December 15th. And it was led not by college students who are the usual suspects for any mm -hmm. social protest or any political protest, any rallies, any such thing, but by housewives, women, many of them who had not even gone to the local grocery shop, who had never conducted any online purchase or any such thing. And they were the ones who stepped out to protect not just their children and grandchildren, but the idea of India. Mm -hmm. It was very heartwarming to see these 75, 80, 90 year old women at the protest site offering their namaz five times a day at the protest site, but at the same time holding the constitution of India dear. They would have a copy of the constitution with them mm -hmm. and a copy of the Quran with them. And therein lies the hope for India. When an average Indian Muslim holds on to what his religion tells him and holds the, the constitution of India sacrosanct, I think we should rest content the future, inshallah, will be better than what it is today. Yeah. Um, you know, there's also personal experience and perspective. Uh, but uh, there is a fine line between anecdote and reality. And you being a journalist yourself know that treading that line is not an easy line. So how was it, you know, writing this book, balancing your views as a Muslim man and balancing your views as a journalist? See, it wasn't too difficult mm -hmm. because this is a lived experience. Yeah. This is a lived reality for an Indian Muslim. Mm -hmm. and I'm no exception there. Yeah. Like I'll tell you one or two couple, uh, one or two instances right next door from your office and my office. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be said in jest, but back some five years ago, the parking attendant over here, I, I was parking my car and I was in a hurry. So I just left the car almost on the road and gave the key to the parking attendant. The Bia up park kar dena. And he said, okay, I'll park the car. Then he said it in Hindi. Bia is my bum to ni shoda hai. It says a lot about the mindset. Mm -hmm. He won't say it to somebody else. Yeah. It's just that he, and my beard was longer, he could make out that I'm a Muslim. And he felt pr pretty yeah. comfortable making yeah. that kind of remark. These are the kind of things one faces regularly as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. If you go to the airport, the chances are if you're visibly Muslim, in, mm -hmm. even on a domestic circuit, you'll be frizzed more than once yeah. and much more carefully. These are silent things which will not be aired by people mm -hmm. if you speak to the cops over this. We are doing it for everybody. Mm -hmm. But the way he will do it for you and for me, it will be different. And even for the metro, in just before Republic Day, Independence Day, if you're visibly Muslim, their attitude is different. You 
I have had that experience in a mall in Noida when I had gone for grocery purchase with my wife and again I had a long beard at that time and then the security attendant when I was coming out with the trolley mm-hmm. he decided to check every item and there were two three girls who followed me he just had a cursory look and let them go then I objected ke why are you doing this yeah. his reply was aadmi dekh ke baat karna padta hai these are not the things which i ever ever found in my country in the past mm-hmm. yes there were stray elements here and there but they were not even 1% of the total society yeah now so many people feel at liberty that okay you can say anything about a muslim today and you will go unaccounted for mm-hmm. and the prime example of that is again next to delhi yati narsinghanand he gives open calls for genocide not just from dasna where he is based in ghaziabad mm-hmm. but he comes to the press club of india supposedly all the journalists are there mm-hmm. he gives a similar call he abuses the prophet calls for genocide of muslims and no action is taken against him his sidekick pinky chandri comes to jantar mantar holds a protest and raises the slogan jab mulle kaate jayenge tell me how far is the, the headquarters of delhi police from jantar mantar mm-hmm. not even half a kilometer mm-hmm. from there and no action is taken finally when after media wrote about it he was so called arrested and the police allowed him that his supporters will hold a rally <coughs> chanting all the provocative slogans raising him on their shoulders yeah. finally they came right up to the police station gate with the man on their shoulders the criminal on their shoulders and he was garlanded we are living in such times and imagine the plight of bilkis banu the woman who was gang raped in 2002 the fetus from her body was taken out with the threshold she had her own child being gang raped and killed she had her sister and mother being gang raped and killed in front of her and now the convicted gang rapists were given a series of paroles by gujarat government mm-hmm. until finally they were bailed out by the government the woman went back to the supreme court in august last year they were released these convicted gang rapists were released in on august 15th in 2022 see the significance of independence day and they are released from jail and when they were released they were treated to a box of sweets and garlands where have we come as a society forget who was raped forget she was muslim or hindu or any community a woman was raped man was convicted and you are garlanding him what kind of message are you sending to all the women of the country not just muslim women i'm getting goosebumps for talking of it now it's very difficult today to be a muslim and expect justice yeah was it difficult you know reliving all of these events and going back was it a hard process to well, write the book well i thought it pretty answer your question was saying yeah. i have goosebumps yeah. talking of bilkis banu it was emotionally very draining mm-hmm. and also the challenge was it should not become too emotional like an account yeah so i think that is where the editors at harper collins so at the chopra and her team of anju and others they stepped in and i hope we have been able to come up with a book which a common man and woman can identify with without actually thinking that it is just an emotional diatribe mm-hmm. thank you sir um this is tere sudeep signing off for the print uh stay tuned for more soft cover interviews where we launch interesting non fiction books mm-hmm.